I'm going to build on that introduction. Should not be a surprise to any of us that the world has changed and that change has changed our students. In fact, the first reference on the handout uh, is that, in fact, personalities are changing. That if you find your students less open to new experiences, a little more neurotic, a little more, that in fact, the data says that factor five psychology, that their personalities are changing. The, the world has actually changed our students. We should not be surprised. And that has also changed what they want out of education, or at least how they want it delivered. So if you look at this data, you can see that the, the blue, what, what wonderful luck if you're a scholar that you do a survey on student preferences for online learning in March of 2020. And then you can follow it up in October of 2022. Um, and so you can see that students' desire for completely online on the red line went way up for mostly online is up. Uh, the desire for completely face-to-face -face has gone down. Uh, this is not a big surprise. What's really interesting, though, is that students, these are, the, these are the things they say, well, what would you like about homework, exams, study guides? What is very important to have online? Notice that the bottom, nothing got less than 42%. 42% said everything has to be online. In other words, not, not every class session, but online, office hours, group activities, um, uh, discussions, recorded lectures, um, et cetera. So I am convinced that uh, the future uh, is going to be blended. Uh, we, we do too many things online, right, banking, et cetera. We do too many of these things online, not to think at least some of education will be online. So the real question for us is what do we put online and what do we do face to face? If we are going to ask students to come to our classrooms, to, to drive, to park, to, to commute, uh, to assemble, whatever it is, that costs something. It costs time, it costs effort, it costs money. It has to be better than just something they could have done at home in their underwear. It has to be better than just something they could have watched online. Right? It can't just be, I'm going to lecture just like you were at home on Zoom. There has to be something that happens here uh, that is better and special. Now we know that things online that, that, that can be, right, movies, can be amazing. They can do things we couldn't imagine. So when COVID hit, we promised students online teaching. Online teaching has a promise like Star Wars the movie. It can do things that we can't do face to face. But did we deliver Star Wars the movie to our students? No. During COVID, it was more like Star Wars the play. The amateur theater production, emergency remote teaching. So we can do things differently online, but it can't just be, hello, we're on Zoom today. And what I'm seeing so far, certainly in American universities, is what they're calling Zoom Friday. I visited 40 American colleges um, this fall, and the problem is that Friday is even more of a ghost town because Faculty don't want to drive to come in. Students don't want to come in. So they're just doing Zoom Fridays. That's the worst of both worlds. That is blended, surely, but it is the worst of both worlds. It is just moving something into a Zoom setting. Um, that's not very useful. So at the same time that we're being asked to change the modality of how we teach and become more blended, we're also asking to be more inclusive, to teach more students. We have more students who've never been to college, their parents have never been to college. We're trying to increase the population of, of who um, has access to higher education. So, not surprising, I think that all good teaching is inclusive teaching. The truth is, your best students were probably going to be fine without you. You should judge the quality of your teaching by how the bottom half of your class do. The top half of your class is probably going to be fine. So that means that all good teaching is really the teaching that reaches the bottom half of the class, the least prepared, right, is inclusive teaching. And so these four principles to me um, are things that we should think about. Um, transparency, is it clear? Because again, for the students who are at the top half of the class who are good at school, they know how things work. 
but are we transparent to everyone? A sense of belonging turns out to be critical for learning. Then motivation, right? You're going to hear a lot about chat GPT and various sorts of tools. Um, and the truth is, I am not as concerned as most people um, because I haven't been policing student activity um, for 40 years. If I'd wanted to do that, I would have become a policeman. But I don't want to police students. The world is open book. When they graduate, they're going to go into this world that's open book. So how can I design learning that takes advantage of that, that they learn in the same way they're going to learn? And that's really about motivation. And then finally, about scaffolding. How do we structure learning um, so that students can fail and recover and, and keep going? So I want to introduce you to John Powell, uh, who's an American lawyer at Berkeley, who came up with this idea of targeted universalism, which is that what we should do when we design laws in his case, but in my case, teaching, is think about what can we do to help the most disadvantaged among us, the students who are least privileged, without hurting any of the students who are at the top. And so an example of this is the ATM machine. You know ATM machines. You go and you ask for money. The first ATM machines were not so good. They made mistakes. This is not going to make you happy or the bank happy. So they did two things to make the ATM machine better and more foolproof. One is they made the buttons bigger. Is anybody here bothered by bigger buttons? Oh, I wish the buttons were smaller. No, no one cares about, but bigger buttons help those who are visually impaired, but they don't hurt you. They are an example of targeted universalism. And they did one other thing. Are you sure you want to take out cash? Are you really sure you want to do that? Now, does that take you a little longer? little bit, but it allows you to fail and recover. That's a great principle of teaching, to allow some people to fail. And because, oh, no, no, I don't want cash. Oh, stop. It's too late. Your account is closed. That was not very good. So building in redundancy and a chance for failure is also targeted universalism. So I want to apply these things uh, to these four areas as we think both about how do we create new blended learning environments and how do we also become more inclusive? There's the opportunity here to create a better educational system for more people, but it's only potential. We could also do this horribly and end up having it be worse. So let's start with motivation. Why is there someone here doing push-ups? And you're thinking, he looks strange. He has those muscles and he's doing push-ups. What a strange thing. When you go to the gym, if you go to the gym and you see your fitness teacher comes out and he has these big muscles and you think, how strange. That person, he likes fitness so much, he does push-ups for fun. And that's how students look at you. You like the library so much, you go there for fun. That's weird. That's strange. So you are not a great model. In the same way that when I, go to the, when I go to the fitness center, I want someone who's going to inspire me and structure, scaffold for me, an exercise plan that I will feel I can do competently. But I know the person who's doing that is a little odd. But I also know that watching someone else do push-ups is not that useful even if they're intellectual push-ups. So when we're standing at the chalkboard doing push-ups for students, we're not being that helpful. We have to stop and say, now I need you to do the push-ups. And what happens at the gym when the coach says, it's your turn to do push-ups? What do I say? No, please demonstrate some more. I don't want it, right? So students are naturally going to resist doing the work that only they can do. So we have to constantly be reminding students that they need to do the push-ups, that's who gets the benefit, but also to think that our job is the same as that of a fitness coach. Our job is to structure an environment where you will do one more, 
where you will try one more math problem, where you will put in a little extra effort. So that's why I'm not worried about chat GPT, because my job is not to prevent you from using tools. My real job is to motivate you to understand why this learning will benefit you. And the truth is, if I can't convince you that this learning will benefit you, then you should use ChatGPT. And in fact, most workplaces are already using it to write emails, to do all sorts of things. The workplace is changing right before our very eyes. We heard about at-home learning. So I don't think we should be, I think our job is primarily on the front end of motivation. So my apologies to the psychologists, but I have to do a little bit of psychology. What motivates humans? Well, the same thing that motivates most creatures, three things. The first is salience or relevance. Is this worthwhile? Does it have meaning? So, real experiment, if I say to you, carry these rocks up the hill, and I say to you, carry these rocks up the hill so we can build this cathedral where your grandchildren can pray, or this mosque, or this synagogue, or this school. You carry more rocks than you do, and you carry them more carefully. Right? Just saying, carry rocks, do your problems, doesn't, doesn't work in the workplace, it doesn't work in school. In fact, it doesn't work uh, in this, this experiment of find the, click on the, this was done on, on, uh, on MTurk, click on the red dots, the red cells. And then another group was told, those are cancer cells. Do you think that changed people's attitude? It's the same project, but they're red and one objects of interest. Find cancer cells. Do you think people clicked on more or fewer times? And they were paid by click when they were told they were cancer cells. Do they click more? They click less. They take less money, but they do more quality work. Would you take a little less but more quality work from your students. So you know how you can do this? With one sentence. The data shows us that one sentence, when you assign students, read chapter two. Eh. Read chapter two and find something you disagree with. Read chapter two and find a relative who has that. Read chapter two and think what information is missing. That one sentence added increases motivation and increases what students remember a week later, two weeks later. Simple. Right? That one little change, adding a little bit of motivation, a little bit of engagement makes a difference. But once you're engaged, I have to keep you engaged. Right? And so if I tell you to do this thing, I want you to lift these rocks. And the rocks are too big, you still don't do it. Right? And if the rocks are too small, you quit. Right? So you want your lessons to be optimally challenging. Well, guess who can do this really well? Video games. They call this pleasantly frustrating. Because when a game is pleasantly frustrating, it's not too hard, it's not too easy. You keep going. And that's what they want you to do. They want you to play more video games. And that's what our classrooms should be like. But the problem is I can't individually change like a video game can. A video game can say it's too hard for you, it gets easier. It's too easy for you, it gets harder. And in the classroom, I have to teach to the middle because that's all I can do. But there is a surrogate, and that surrogate is optimism. When you believe you can do something, you are more motivated to do it. So first is relevance, second is optimism, and third is agency or autonomy. And that's why I put a tennis net up here. Can you learn tennis without a teacher? Yes. Can you learn tennis without a net? It's harder. So sometimes you need instruction. You need a lesson. You need move your feet, move your hands, hold. And sometimes you just, no, I just need some more balls. Let me hit some more balls. Because the net is the perfect feedback mechanism for learning. It's instant. It's immediate. The ball hit the net. That didn't work. I have to try something else. The net is also objective. It's trustworthy. Right? I trust it. It's the ball didn't go over the net. Oh, the net is cheating. No, the net is objective. Right? It's also specific and action. It's, it's a small, I can understand exactly what the bar is and what I have to do. I can get it in small chunks. 
So we want to be more like a tennis net in our instruction. Right? We want to design an environment where students have agency. Because notice with a tennis net, if you give me the balls, I can now teach myself because I'm getting feedback. So feedback is an essential part of this. So I've talked about engagement, optimism, and agency. I also, in the last book, I call this um, relationships, resilience, and reflection. Another way to say the same three things. If your students all looked like this, would life be easy? Right? She's already ready for learning. She's engaged. She's optimistic. She has agency. There's another way to think about this. Teaching is really about this emotional state. If my students care about the subject, if they believe they can, and they believe they matter, I care, I can, I matter, they will then do the work that only they can do. So a lot of our job is to design an environment, again, like a fitness coach, where students are doing the work. And I will talk more specifics about that in the, in the workshop uh, later today. So let's put this together. So I have <clears throat> new technology, new ways to blend, new options um, to reach students. I now understand what student motivation is like. So what do I mean by more transparency and where do I do that? Well, first of all, again, you're weird. You live in the classroom. You know what the rules are. You think classrooms look like this. But to a student like me, who had never been to university, whose parents had never been, it looks like this. It's like, what is, what? Why are people dressed that way? Why are you all dressed that way? Why do people write, right? What are all those rules? So I'm a big fan of rubrics. 62% of students say that they believe you grade fairly. That's good news. 26% of students say they actually understand how you grade. That means that most students don't have any idea what you're grading them on. You're not a tennis net. You're some random thing that moves around in front of them. They, it's, they don't understand. So, root transparency. I can't hit the target if I don't know where to aim. I show you this only because it took three years of committee meetings. This is an all-campus writing rubric. Every class on campus says writing is similar. Now, individual professors can make changes to the middle, to the, to the numbers, but every class, every writing assignment on campus cares about ideas. Every class cares about evidence. Every class cares about organization and language maturity. Yeah, three years to come up with those words. But you know how this works. <laughs> but it was worth it because students were able to say, oh, I just thought I was supposed to figure out what you wanted versus what you wanted. And now they said, no, this is what academic writing looks like, and the history department could make their version, and the chemistry department could make their version. So transparency helps people understand um, what we're trying to accomplish. Even something as simple as office hours, going to visit the professor. So the light blue is what students think office hours are for, and the dark blue is what you think they're for. They're a little different, right? We think it's time. Together, we might talk about study skills. No student ever said office hours were for study skills. So there's a disconnect. So we should explain to students. So in the age of, of technology, what does that mean? It means you need an e-communication policy. How do I get in touch with you? Do I go to hours? What are they for? It means you need to think about how your materials are organized. One of students' big complaints during COVID was they couldn't find materials. Our stuff wasn't organized. And I thought, but of course it's organized. It's organized chronologically. And then I thought, oh, I understand how the course is organized chronologically, but students don't because it's their first time taking the course. And if they miss, so I now double index all of my videos and my materials. So one is alphabetical, one is chronological. So students can have two different ways to find material. So related to transparency is a sense of I matter, a sense of belonging. So office hours, what is your e-communication policy? Do I need an appointment? Do I just show up? Where, where do they happen? All those sorts of things. It turns out that this is a perception that if students believe that you care, they learn more. 
do you have to actually care? No, it's a perception, but you know, you do care. But it really is true that it's about how you demonstrate this. Is it visible to students that you care? So I stand at the door in a big classroom like this and I give out the handouts and I greet students. Can I greet every student in a 600 seat classroom? Of course not. But they can all see me saying hello to a few students and giving out the handout. And it turns out that makes a difference. Students, as you all know, like video. The internet is mostly about video, so an introductory video is very useful. So sending out a video that says, I am looking forward to seeing you. I have high standards. Here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what the class is about. That's actually the first thing that you should do, because students are making a personal judgment, right? Humans first decide if they like you, and then decide if you're an expert and your information is good. The first thing is, do I feel an emotional connection? And then I send a pre-class survey. So pre-class surveys are great things, and many of us do this. But what we often do is say, what do you know about my subject? And what is that about? Me! So better first question, students, I'd like to know under what circumstances you do your best work. Tell me something about you and what I could do to help you. That's a better first question. And the second question is, what do you know about my subject? And more students will answer the second one if you first ask them about themselves. So both online and in person, arrive early, stay late, but being visible, it is a perception that students want to see that you care. And it turns out this is not just some extra. It is at the core of what human beings do when they learn. Right? They decide, do I want to learn from you? Right, that relationships really are step one, they're key. Here's another easy one. Come into class, there's a, there's a code on the, tell me how you're feeling today. What's on your mind? It's a word cloud and students can, this is from actually a New Zealand university gave me this idea. Um, and then students can see, ah, other students are feeling the same thing and you cared enough to ask. It's a very simple technique, it works online, it works face to face. This is about emails from the US Department of Veterans Affairs, and they wanted veterans to take up career counseling. Um, and so they said, you're eligible, good news. Then they changed one word, and I recognize this is an English example, but it works, I think, in other languages. They changed eligible to you have earned, and 9% more people clicked through. That is, again, if we were, if this was a marketing conference, you would all be going, yeah, I can sell more Coke, more McDonald's, what I can sell more, right? It's the same principle. Humans are humans. They respond to invitations in a different way. And so the framing of what are we doing office hours for matters. So the tone, what well, I want to help you. So why do you even call them office hours, success hours? In a blended environment, you might say, well, on, the, on, on evenings or on the weekend, we have a faculty member who's going to be in the lab there to help you. Just like doctors rotate who's on call. We do this in our, in our journalism lab. We have one person on call every weekend. So you have to do it once a semester, and you're there for four hours on a Sunday. But students know there's a faculty member there, and they come in. Or you do it online. So just being online the night before an exam. Those of you who have never done this, try this. Right? I'm going to be online Tuesday night before the midterm on Wednesday or before the paper is due. You will not believe the emails and, and the, the gratitude that you will receive because, again, it's you're making the effort to be in the place that students are. And again, for someone like me, why would I go to office hours? What are they for? Maybe give me an example. So the first day of class on your syllabus is a, is a time to help students understand what, what is this thing? thing, the student office hours, what is my relationship with you? That's going to be different in different cultures and different countries, but it's vital for students to understand what it is, and it's only obvious to us because we live here. So let's start at the bottom. This is data. This is very recent. It's a few months ago. What are the top actions that faculty could take to help students succeed? And these were the top answers. Taking more of an interest in getting to know students. Think about that. That's the students... This, right, clear expectations. By the way, clear expectations is also the top of the Gallup poll of workplaces. It's the same thing that, 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 that workers want. Clear expectations. More flexible about attendance or participation. We'll talk about scaffolding in a minute. More open to other teaching styles. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, 
being more flexible about deadlines. And we'll talk about that again also in the, in the uh, I got, oh, I have just one more thing to do, good. And I'll talk more about this in the, in the workshop today. So what students want is both structure and flexibility. Think about when I go to the gym. I go to the gym and the, and the coach says, okay, 100 push-ups, do them. I'll be back in an hour. Am I motivated? Do I understand what, right? No. So what, is, what does she do? Okay, let's see if you can do five. <gasps> okay, four. Okay, four. I'll do four. One more. I did five. Break time. Break time. I did five. Okay, let's do three more. And after an hour, I've done 100. I did 100. But I didn't know I could do 100. And it wasn't just do 100, right? So the, so the coach's job, the teacher's job, is to scaffold both structure and flexibility so that I have a way to actually achieve my goal. So it turns out that academic environments, where we live, are procrastination friendly. Don't you wish you were the scholar who, who invented that term? Procrastination friendly. And so it turns out that students actually, there's a reference if you want to, it's actually image. students procrastinate more than people in the workplace, partly because of the way this, the schedule is set. And people in the workplace procrastinate a lot. So students procrastinate more. So what can we do to help them structure their work? Well, <clears throat> number one is motivation. So <clears throat> I'm gonna argue later today that right, everything you give them, every assignment needs to have one sentence of why. Why are we doing this? Some optimism, some agency, something in there. And it turns out that really makes a difference, just like it does in my push-ups. I'll also talk about cognitive wrappers. So once the assignment is done, we don't build in enough reflection time. What did you learn? How could you make it better the next time? Let's stop and spend three minutes to do that. That also makes a difference. Students, though, also want, they do better with smaller deadlines and more deadlines. Think about the Olympics. Think about high-pressure situations, midterm, final. Does that improve anybody's performance? It really doesn't. There are a couple of Olympic athletes who somehow manage to do things under pressure. But for most of us, pressure, high stakes, is going to lower performance. So what we want to do is lower the stakes with more deadlines, closer together, more little things to do. And the smallest of those things is attendance. So this is a terrible slide, I'm sorry, but the references are in there. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of work done post-COVID now because students post-COVID are used to not going to class or not going to class wearing any pants. And so now that they're being asked to go to class, they well, can I watch it on Zoom? Can I do a... So that, again, to me, that is not what I mean by blended. Blended is not some students are online, what's called high flex. Sometimes some students are in class. That is the worst and hardest place to teach. I would much rather have students 10 at a time, all face-to-face, -face, and nobody online. That's much more effective. And then rotate who comes face-to-face, -face, rather than everybody has this kind of flexibility. I need more structure at the same time. So students actually want to be required to go to class. But they also want some get out of jail free cards. They want some flexibility. So just like they want more smaller assignments, the solution here is to say, you have to come to class, but you get four free passes. And again, there's lots of ways of doing this technologically um, or, you know, if you don't want to, do, I, do, I use index cards because I like low tech and I like students to, to I, I ask students to bring an index card to every class with their name on it and then I give them something. So when you did the reading, write down your favorite quote. Write down the thing you liked the least. What did you have the biggest argument with in the reading? What was the problem that was the hardest in the assignment? Today, right? Something on an index card. Then they come to class, share it with your neighbor. There's something that, engage, that happens right away. That they're having to talk to somebody. They're having to defend a position. Um, so those things happen right away. So students want both more structure and more flexibility. And I think there are some clever ways now to give it to them. Um, but that is the new challenge. Is how do I get them to class? How do I get them off their phones, and again, policing, taking their phone. Have you ever tried taking the phone away from an adolescent, those of you with children? In fact, somebody actually tried this experiment. I, I tried this. 
the plastic shoe rack on the back of the door, put your phones there during class, then they watched them buzz the whole time. They were watching, this, they were watching their phones buzz. and re- They were totally distracted. It was a terrible idea. So I have a new title for you. Professor? Yes, okay, professing. There are, there are lots of people online professing without any pants on right now. So you can profess, and you do have content matters, but you're also a designer. You're a curator. You're a role model. You're also all about motivation. So my new title for us is Cognitive Coach. Because you can't do the work. Our job is to design an environment, whether it's online. I do think it will be blended. But to design an environment that the most students, and again, the most students, I don't mean your top performers. They're already motivated. I mean your worst performers, your least prepared, the students who most need your help. Can I design an environment where they will do more intellectual push-ups? That's really our job. We are cognitive coaches. And it's a very, very hard job. And we don't get paid enough to do it. But for what you do, and you are, remember, you're an intellectual superhero to your, to your students. That's why you get to wear your superhero costume at graduation, right? Your superhero co- with, the, with the cape. No. Okay, okay. I tried. All right. So for that, I, I thank you. I honor you. This is, this is really, really hard work. And so if you really want to blow a student's mind when they ask a question, demonstrate to them that you too are changing and thinking. That's a great question. I may have to get back to you later. That demonstrates slow thinking, right? That, not, that you don't have to know all the answers. You're not smart like a smartphone, which is just the smartphone has more. Smart people are smart because they change their mind. The ability to change your mind is what will give you an advantage in this world. So you want a model for students that you can change your mind. And if you really, really want to blow a student's mind, you know, thank you for that question. You may have changed my mind. That is giving agency and motivation to students, and it makes all the difference in the world. I thank you. I look forward to seeing you later. Thank you very much.